afternoon, everybody. It is such an honor to have you join us for the first Facts Over Fear webinar series program. Uh, today's program is going to focus specifically on the Islamophobia industry. And I want to start by introducing myself. My name is Anila Afzali, and I am the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network, or AMEN, at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, or MAPS, in Redmond. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Faith Action Network and on the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network Steering Committee. And I'm always honored to stand next to my dear brother, uh, my partner in good, uh, the, uh, the esteemed Reverend Terry Kylo. Hey everybody, we're so glad to have you join us today. My name is Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor and have been for nearly 30 years now. In the last five years, I've been working to counter uh, Islamophobia uh, with, with Anila and with many other Muslims across Washington State and across the country. Um, and so I, I'm currently the executive director of Paths to Understanding and I'm the founder of Neighbors in Faith. Paths to Understanding uh, is an organization that bridges bias and builds unity through multi-faith peacemaking here in Washington State. And we're just so happy to have you all join us today. And I will say that I am a recovering attorney. Uh, I left my legal career in 2013 in order to focus on some of the work that we've been doing in terms of interfaith bridge building, peacemaking, helping bring people together and build the understanding and unity that we so desperately need, especially at a time when there's so much divisiveness in our country. So it's been an honor to get to work on the front lines of some of that work. Uh, and this series that we're doing, the Facts Over Fear series, is specifically a part of that. And I know Reverend Terry and I, we're very proud of this video campaign uh, that we've started, these, this Facts Over Fear, the animated videos. There are five different animated videos that we launched earlier this year, but we wanted to, especially in light of the pandemic and the upcoming election, we wanted to launch a webinar series to go into further detail beyond just the specific animated videos. Hopefully you've seen the videos, but if you haven't, you'll get a chance to see it with us. Us. And if you have seen them, you'll get to see them again uh, because they're always great reminders and they are short videos, but hopefully with our conversation, with the additional content that we'll be providing and hopefully with the questions uh, that you'll be asking us that we'll be able to answer, we will be better prepared for dealing with the kinds of hate and bigotry and discrimination against Muslims and other communities that we are seeing around us today. And this is especially important at a time when it is an important election year. During this critical election year, it's more important than ever for us to come together and have the kind of unity and have that strong commitment to combating hate and bigotry, especially as we know, according to research, according to studies, that Islamophobia or anti-Muslim fear, bigotry, and, and hatred really does increase. We see spikes in it uh, when it comes to election cycles. So so in light of that, it's so important for us to do this kind of webinar, and it couldn't be a success without your participation. So please do start thinking about the questions you're going to want to ask us, and hopefully you will join us every week for the next, uh, today and the next four weeks, where we talk each week about one specific focus area uh, connected to the different topics of our animated videos. Today's is the Islamophobia industry. We're also going to cover four other topics, including women in Islam, what is Sharia, Islam and other faith traditions, uh, and Islam and peace as well. So please join us for as many of those, hopefully all, that you can. And I also wanted, before I turn it over to my dear brother to, to start us off with a formal presentation, uh, I did want to recognize or acknowledge, let's say, that it is uh, the uh, football season has started. Today was opening week uh, for the Seahawks. And as you can tell from my, my uh, gear, my uh, attire, I am a huge Seahawks fan. Go Hawks with their huge win, 38-25 over the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, and I also want to just add that the same way that I am a proud number 12, and that's why I deck myself out like this during football season on, on Sundays, it's the very same reason that I personally choose to wear a head covering, because I am a proud Muslim in the very same way. So we'll get more into that, especially, I hope, when we talk about the Women in Islam uh, series. Uh, but I also want to add, in all seriousness, besides the, the Go Hawks part, uh, I do want to recognize that we are on tribal land, uh, and also recognize that our country was built on the, black, on the backs of our Black sisters and brothers, families and friends, uh, who we are 
are indebted and grateful to as well. So I hope that gives you a quick overview of the Facts Over Fear series, the webinar series. And now I'm going to turn it over to my dear brother to, to take us uh, into uh, the whole Islamophobia industry uh, before we get back to me and I'll talk a little bit about its impacts. And then we will turn to your questions. So please start thinking about your questions and feel free to use the ask feature uh, to ask your questions uh, as soon as you have them. So go right ahead, dear brother. Hey, well, Anila, thank you so much. And, and again, I, I really appreciate the, the recognition of, of, uh, of the fact that we're all living, uh, whoever we're watching this on tribal land and, and acknowledging the racial injustices and the other kinds of racial and religious bigotry that, that are part of the history of this country. And if you wanna join us in our campaign, it's not just about a webinar. Um, you can go to factsoverfear.org. You can sign up for a newsletter. You can also use the hashtag factsoverfear uh, when you're reposting um, our, our, uh, our, our social media. Um, uh, I'm sorry, something is wrong with my computer. Here we go. So our webinar today is, um, is going to last about an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to cover a lot of ground. There'll be time for Q&A um, at the end of our sessions. We really encourage you just to write the questions whenever they occur to you, and we'll try to get, get to them all. Um, after about an hour and 15 minutes, if you want to kick off and, and go up, go about your day, that's fine. But we're happy to stay around longer um, if, uh, if you all are continuing to ask questions and be engaged. Um, you can join us on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. We don't do Twitter quite so much, but we're just so happy to have you join us today for the Facts Over Fear webinar. And first, we're going to start off watching one of the videos that Anil and I were, were lucky enough to be able to, to produce. Um, this one's on the Islamophobia industry, and every single part of this that we've done here now has been very carefully edited, and we just encourage you to, to watch it, and we'll talk about it on the other side. We love America, a nation built on an aspirational idea that all people are created equal and have inalienable rights. We built our constitutional values piece by piece to strive for a more perfect union of all people no matter where they come from, what their abilities are, or how they do or do not worship. Sadly, some people want to tear our constitutional values down. They spend millions of dollars each year to make us afraid of some of our neighbors, American Muslims. They use the power of fear to divide us. This is the Islamophobia industry. They spread lies about our American Muslim neighbors, they want to limit the religious liberty of American Muslims. They dehumanize American Muslims by presenting them as a threat. They do this with books, TV pundits, websites, social media, and messaging studies. Yes, that's right. They actually study how to make Americans afraid of other U.S. citizens. This has real everyday consequences like increased hate crimes against American Muslims, ineffective and expensive bias-based surveillance programs, fewer resources available to stop those actually doing crimes, and religious discrimination in our laws like anti-Muslim bills in about a dozen states, and even the shameful Muslim travel ban. The Islamophobia industry seeks to tear down what we have built together, weakening the rights that we all benefit from so they can sell more guns, more bombs, more prisons, more of our young people going to war, and always more and more fear of others. This hurts all of us as Americans, but we do not have to live this way. As patriotic Americans, we know we should learn about Islam from Muslims, not those who hate them. We should all be judged by what we do, not by what others do in our name. We should have evidence-based investigations that are more effective at keeping all of us safe, not prejudice-based investigations, which is what Islamophobia is. Let's reject the fear, hate, divisiveness, and un-American values that the Islamophobia industry sells. Standing together for the rights of all people is how we strengthen our own rights and keep our nation strong. American Muslims share the same American values and freedoms we all cherish, knowing that we are all in this together. So let's work together to build our constitutional values, achieve the idea that we are all created equal, and fulfill the pledge of one nation 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You can learn more about the Islamophobia Network at www.islamophobia.org and www.islamophobianetwork.com. So thank you all for, for watching that little video there. It was a real pleasure to work on that, um, that video series. And um, I got into this work about five years ago um, or so when I went to a small town named Oak Harbor, Washington, which is a little military town, invited to go with a Muslim friend of mine and try to counter some of the anti-Muslim bigotry there. We ended up doing five of those uh, in a series uh, throughout Western Washington State. And what I began to realize was that everywhere we went, we heard the same questions in almost the same language, saw the same fear, saw the same hate and prejudice in all those different, different locations. And of course, those people didn't know each other. So how is it that they were all saying the same thing? How come their messaging was so consistent, even though they didn't know each other? And I began to do some really, uh, really significant study into why, um, why these messages were the same. And of course, it's that there's anti-Muslim hate groups working overtime uh, to actually um, dehumanize our American Muslim neighbors, that there's an intentional campaign of dehumanization against our Muslim neighbors. And I knew that um, when I was in seminary as a Lutheran pastor, we heard about the dehumanization campaign against our Jewish neighbors in Germany. And we all sat around the cafeteria, you know, after those classes and said, you know, if we saw that sort of thing happening, you know, in our time, we're going to say something. And I realized fairly quickly that I needed to spend uh, a lot of my life, and I, in fact, resigned from churches to be able to do this work. And, of course, the, the folk in Western Washington that, heard, that asked those questions, that repeated those messages, they, they aren't alone. Um, in the United States, uh, in, in PPP polling, did a, a study in 2015 of, of uh, voters that were likely to vote, asking, should the U.S. bomb Agraba, uh, an Arabic-sounding uh, city name? and 25% were in favor automatically, and 51% were not sure. And of course, the problem is that Agrabah does not exist except in the Disney film Aladdin. And so there's this, this sort of bias against Islam, against Arabic sounding uh, names of city names. And if you think carefully for a minute, like what's in a city? But people were all of a sudden, 25% were ready to bomb it, and 51% weren't sure even though they could not possibly have had any policy reason for, for doing so. So a guy named Irvin Staub, who I've been reading some of his books lately, uh, one called The Roots of Evil. And he says that, that countries uh, that have a, con have a context in which um, mass violence against groups of people becomes more likely. And, and one of the self-concepts that he's found, uh, one of the, is, is a, a mixture of superiority and self-doubt or persecution. We can actually hear this in the current occupant of the White House that talks about how great America is, but how some Americans are being persecuted. And if we could just get rid of those other people, everything would be great. And then the whole thing rinses and repeats. But what he's also found, uh, Professor Staub has also found that difficult life conditions also are an important uh, ingredient to, pro to pro providing a situation where people could do mass violence to each other. And if you think about our current situation, we've got 50% of Americans are chronically lonely. Uh, we've got wealth and income inequality at levels higher than they were uh, around the time of the Great Depression. Wages have been flat, but we've seen an incredible increase in rent and also in home prices. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of folk in our country really struggling. And now that the pandemic is here, we're not only seeing uh, unjust impacts of the pandemic economically on people of color, but, uh, but there's about a, a 40% of the, of the economy is just like really fallen to the ground. And another third seems to be doing just fine. Um, also, he found in his study of, of cultures that, that, that begin to do mass violence toward people, that there's a kind of a longstanding racism that often uh, is a justification for, for that mass violence. Now, in his later book, Roots of Goodness, he, he proposes that there's, there's one thing that can make a huge difference, and that is people moving from being passive bystanders, watching a group of people get dehumanized, and be, people becoming active bystanders. And this is what he says. 
Opposition from bystanders, whether based on moral or other grounds, can change the perspective of perpetrators and other bystanders, especially if the bystanders act at an early point on the continuum of destruction. And if there's one thing this whole thing is about for us, is we want to encourage you to go from being a passive bystander to being an active bystander, whether it's with the Muslim community or the Jewish community, the Latinx community, the African American community, I mean, whoever. But, but all, of, all of these groups need, need assistance from people to, who, who move from being passive bystanders and wishing them well to actively working uh, for their humanity. So Ibram X. Kendi in his wonderful book, Stamp from the Beginning, uh, really challenges one of our notions about how hate gets started. We all think that racism and, and policies that, that don't make sense, policies that disadvantage people of color, people of different religious traditions, starts with hate. But what he actually says is it starts with economic and political self-interests of a few people, right? And then these people then create racially discriminatory policies that benefit them and disadvantage uh, the smaller groups in the country. These then that get justified by racist ideas, which then begin to generate hate and ignorance in the larger population. And then over time, all of these begin to feed on each other. We also know right now in our country that we're having a serious conversation about race and racism. And, uh, and, and we typically talk about racism as having four expressions, intrapersonal, interpersonal, institutional, and structural. Often in our public conversations, of course, we talk about racism as if it's only interpersonal nastiness. But we know that that's only one part of kind of a matrix or the expressions of racism that are important for us to deal with. And so as I've gotten to think about Islamophobia and doing the work that I've been doing, I've realized that I have a lot of intrapersonal racism toward Muslims. I have a lot of Islamophobia in me. And one of the most painful and rewarding parts of the work that I've been doing is being able to co confront uh, the Islamophobia within me and do some of that internalized work. And I've met many Muslims who themselves have said that they experience some intrapersonal racism as if some of the racism of the larger country infects them and, and begins to impact them. And so what do Muslims teach each other about, about this situation? Oh, mankind, we have created you from a male and female and have made you into nations and tribes for you to know one another. And now, so the fact that there's diversity and difference in religion and culture and every other kind of difference within the human community, that's not a bug. That's not a problem. That's a feature of the creation made by the creator. So in other words, we're all here to get to know each other and to welcome each other in peace. But we also know that racism uh, also has a lot of interpersonal expression. We know that in the last number of years, total anti-Muslim bias incidents have been on the rise. We know that anti-Muslim hate crimes have been on the rise, as well as toward other groups, including our Jewish neighbors. And so what do Muslims teach about interpersonal you know, challenges, interpersonal expressions of racism? Well, essentially the same thing that many other religions teach, that the good deed and the evil deed are not equal. Repel by that which is better, and then behold, the one between whom and thee there is enmity shall be as if he were a loyal protecting friend. In other words, this is a similar teaching to Jesus saying, pray for those that persecute you, do good to those who harm you, love your enemies. But we also know that institutional expressions of racism are really critical uh, as, as they impact our, our Muslim sisters and brothers. So one example of this was a Cargill, a, an, an agricultural uh, firm, uh, would not allow their Muslim workers to use a break room to pray throughout the day. And the Teamsters Union refused to stand up with them. And ultimately they had to take both of them to court and they won a settlement regarding that. So we see both a union and a an agricultural conglomerate basically engaging in institutional racism toward our Muslim sisters and brothers. We know from a study from the Institute for, for Social Policy and Understanding that, uh, that about 42% of all Muslim families experience some bullying at least once a year, some many more times a year. And that 25% of the time, that bullying comes from a teacher or an administrator. We know when it comes to the media that we've got some serious institutional Islamophobia. 
where people who perpetrate violent crimes, if they're perceived to be Muslim, receive well over two times the amount of media coverage as people who do similar crimes and who are not perceived to be Muslim. Take, for example, uh, Dylan Roof. Um, when have you heard in the media a long conversation or a repeated conversation about his uh, faith tradition? Actually, Dylan Roof was a Lutheran, the same, same denomination as I. And I've never once been asked uh, by anybody to justify myself based on his actions. I've never been blamed for his actions. Uh, most of the time, uh, and Dylan Roof was never called a radical Lutheranist. Um, and yet, if he was Muslim, I think the story would be different. We also know that many parts of the Christian church uh, express a great deal of institutional Islamophobia. But I need to say that I've been in over 120 churches since I first started this work, and I've yet to find one, even those who consider themselves very progressive or moderate or, or, or whatever, um, that, that has been devoid of, of Islamophobia of some kind. Um, there's a great deal of institutional Islamophobia throughout the Christian church. But just to be clear, there's also liberal Islamophobia in the media, as Bill Maher often speaks poorly of all religion, but applies, you know, very, very copious amounts of collective blame to our Muslim sisters and brothers. But there's one other institution that really takes the cake in all this and actually helps to generate a lot of the rest of it. And that is the Islamophobia industry. They spend about $30 million a year uh, at, creating a lot of uh, negative uh, impressions of our Muslim neighbors, actively dehumanizing them. Uh, and and they, they do so through lots of different methods. They use white papers to policymakers. They write books and YouTube videos that show up on our iPads while we're eating breakfast, uh, building networks, a lot of social media. They write blogs and they do media appearances. They lobby they do speaking tours, and they do messaging studies. They actually, as we said in the video, study how to make people fearful of their American Muslim neighbors. Like that's what they do. Uh, that active dehumanization, when I found that out, is what led me to do what I'm doing. Because I knew that I could not stand idly by and let that happen. Because that dehumanization is not good for any of us. These anti-Muslim hate groups have a lot of names. There's about 34 across the country. You know, two that I'll talk about today, one is Act for America and the other is the Center for Security Policy. Act for America, for instance, claims to have a weekly meeting at the White House. We don't know if that's true, but we've not seen anywhere the White House saying that this is not true. There's also the Center for Security Policy, who's run by a gentleman named Frank Gaffney, who was a Reagan administration official, and um, has intense and, and deep contacts throughout the neoconservative movement uh, in, in, uh, in the United States. And, uh, and these folk are working at a very high level in the current administration and throughout all of kind of the, the military industrial complex. And basically what they're doing is back to Abram X. Kendi's uh, idea that racism usually starts with political and economic and self-interests Essentially, what they're doing is they're trying to say that Muslims are a threat, you know, universally, um, so that they can sell more bombs and guns. That's really what they're what they're all about. But structurally, we also see a lot of racism toward our Muslim neighbors. So, of the thousand films in the previous century that were studied that had an a an Arab or a Muslim character, um, over 936 of those characters were, were negatively portrayed and only 12 were positive. If we look on, on TV news, we see that even though Muslims make up only 1% of the population, that they get about 50% of the coverage of religious folk in the country. And on the right side of the graph, we can see that only about 5% of that coverage is positive. Um, one example of this was the Washington Times, who in 2015 said that the majority of fatal attacks uh, on US soil carried out by white supremacists, not terrorists. Which is a way to sort of take that T word there and make it into a cultural epithet. That's essentially what they're doing. The New York Times, however, is, is, no, uh, is, is not innocent in this either. The New York Times refers to Muslims and Islam more negatively than cancer or cocaine. So found 416 labs in a study that they've done over the last 25 years in the New York Times. 
in our sentencing that happens in our courtrooms, there's tremendous structural racism. The average sentence sought is about three times higher for perceived Muslim uh, uh, perpetrators, and it's four times, they receive four times the amount of sentences. We see also across the country anti-Sharia legislation put into place by, by lawmakers and being argued for. And of course, the purpose of those of those um, that legislation, as David Yeroshami, the guy who wrote um, who wrote the legislation, says, it, it would not have served its purpose without any friction. Like the purpose was heuristic to get people asking this question: what is Sharia? So the, the point of some of these structural issues is that they help provide um, rationale for people holding personal hate. And this creates a, a really terrible cycle. We have, of course, structurally right now, our, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, with clear uh, and, and, and consistent um, connections to Act for America and for the Center of Security Policy. And when he was asked by Cory Booker uh, during his confirmation hearing if he would reject his connection to these hate groups, um, hate groups that are named hate groups by my by the, both the ADL, um, by the Southern Poverty Law Center and many others, Mike Pompeo would not renounce those connections. But we also know there's governmental Islamophobia, TSA boredom random checks that always seem to pull, pull aside my friends who happen to be Muslim. No fly lists, uh, counteracting violent extremism that all too often focuses exclusively uh, on, on members of the Muslim community. Surveillance programs that do the same. And of course, the Muslim ban that's keeping families apart and continuing to provide rationale to people in their own bigotry. So what do Muslims say about this? How do they respond to this? Well, what I've heard in, in their Islamic centers and mosques is, oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents or relatives. So we know right now we've got a lot of racism, both intrapersonal, interpersonal, institutional, and structural coming at our Muslim neighbors. Um, and in the last century, I have a terrible number here to talk to you about. In the last century, 262 million people were killed by genocide uh, in, in the 20th century. Uh, 262 million people. And that doesn't just happen easily or by accident. Um, there's a wonderful scholar named Jonathan Leader Maynard, who is studying uh, the, the kind of speech that leads to mass violence, kind of a pro psychological and speech process. And what he says, is it starts out with an us and a them. Somebody says there's an us and a them, and they begin to dehumanize the people who are perceived to be other, calling them animals, uh, referring to them in, in really derogatory ways, that they're not really human for one reason or another, and then they begin to apply collective blame to that entire group for the actions of a few. Like for Christians, you know, we don't blame all Christians for the KKK. We certainly don't blame Jesus for it. But that often happens, that kind of collective blame happens toward, toward many other groups that are being dehumanized. And then constantly there's this notion of threat being, being portrayed. That, that, that this group is a threat to everybody else. And what happens with fear is that it becomes real, even if the threat isn't. So the fear is real. Um, and it's, it's palpable inside of people. When we do public presentations, Anil and I can see the fear in people, right? And usually we fear on the basis of that which we love, right? And so it's easy once we start to fear, but because we love our community, we love our family, we love our country, well, then, then, then we start to walk a very dangerous road. Um, then we're proposed by our leaders that there's no alternative, that we have to act now, but that if we act now, a beautiful, peaceful future awaits. And all of this is to say that most people who participate or who are passive bystanders with respect to, to, to mass violence are not seeking to do evil. This is the thing that's just hard to get into our hearts and heads, that they actually are are convinced that violence is necessary and even good and moral. And that is the, is the terrible danger of mass violence uh, be, that, that is created by dangerous speech, dehumanizing speech. And so here's the thing that we're gonna say to you is that you can play a part 
in counteracting that dangerous speech. Um, that you can play a part in, in helping people to understand that what they love, our Muslim neighbors also love, and that you also love. And that fear is infectious, but love can wash it away. But it, it takes much more time to, to create love and trust than it does to create fear. It's easier to create fear on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. It's much more difficult to create love. But we also believe fundamentally that as American citizens, it's the patriotic duty of every uh, citizen to protect the civil rights of all, knowing the best way to protect our own rights is to uphold everyone's rights. And we're actually, we're just asking you to consider uh, growing into being active bystanders and, or growing your skills in being active bystanders to stand with our American Muslim neighbors because, because there's a great amount of money, great amount of economic self-interest and, and policy and, um, and racist language and, and thought that is, that is arrayed against them right now and they need as many uh, allies as they can get. And if you're called to stand with another group, um, amen, and we're so glad that you're gonna do that too. And we hope that you will also be able to speak uh, positively of our Muslim neighbors. So thank you for listening to this. We'll have more about this as we go. And now we're gonna transition into some conversation with Anil. Thank you so very much, dear Reverend Terry. Uh, appreciate your, your words of wisdom, uh, your allyship, uh, your really living out your own faith values. Uh, and that's part of what I want to stress to everybody joining us and listening today, that, you know, as much as it means so much to me to have friends and allies of all faith backgrounds and no faith backgrounds, uh, what I really focus on is the importance of each of us to do what we believe based on our own faith values, on our own moral values. Don't do it because you're saving me. I know you don't do it for this reason, uh, Terry. I know you do it because your faith calls you to do it. And I believe all religion, all world religions have that same emphasis about sort of loving our neighbors as ourselves and doing our part to contribute and create a better society for all. That's certainly what drives me. And again, just by uh, just uh, uh, to repeat to everybody, my name is Anila Afzali, uh, and I am so honored to be able to participate in this Facts Over Fear webinar series with all of you who are joining us today, who are taking time out of your Sunday schedule uh, to really join us and talk about how do we build the beloved community that we all want to see? How do we help overcome the fear and the fear mongering and the divisiveness and the hatred that's really pulling us apart? That's pulling us apart as a country, as communities, as individual families and in, uh, communities as well. It's really heartbreaking to see. And as I mentioned earlier, I myself, you know, I was born Muslim. I was raised by Muslim parents who taught me important Islamic values like service, like honesty, like compassion and mercy and hard work. Uh, I remember working at uh, my various uh, mom and pop shops that my family owned uh, growing up, you know, in the Bay Area and then in Portland, Oregon as well. And this is true of American Muslims across our country who share our country's strong family values and are dedicated to raising and educating their children. American Muslims want to succeed in the very sort of traditional American way by working hard and supporting their families. I know my parents really went out of their way and worked hard to survive and succeed because they wanted to build a better future for their children. Just like countless Americans, uh, American Muslims across our nation, and countless Americans like all of you. And also, my parents wanted us to grow up to be productive citizens as well, contributing to creating a better country for us all. And part of this actually came to me as a sense of pride in America and American values. This was something that was important to me growing up, and I know that the majority of Muslims in our country are in fact Americans in their heart and in fact. Over 80% are U.S. citizens, including some that trace their history in our country back to the very founding of our country, which a lot of people don't know about. 
And I actually want to just share one story about my own personal life that really emphasizes how much these sort of American aspirational values meant to me. Uh, I might share two, we'll see. But <laughs> at least one of them was when I was in about third or fourth grade, uh, I entered a talent show with my younger sister. And the reason for that was growing up poor, ice cream wasn't, uh, you know, something very common that we had. It was a luxury. And when I saw that there was an ice cream party for all participants of this talent show, I jumped right on board. I grabbed my little sister's hand and I said, let's do this. And we were excited to do this. So we went to go and sign up and they asked us, what's your talent? Now, I didn't really have any talents for talent shows. I still don't. Uh, but, you know, I just blurted out, we'll sing, thinking that's easy enough. But then they wanted to know what song. And without even like thinking about it, because I didn't have any particular song in mind, I just said, America the Beautiful. I couldn't sing, but I knew and liked that song. And my little sister and I, we performed it together in front of the entire school auditorium packed in our matching pink and purple dresses. Uh, and we could not sing, so it was really embarrassing, but we got our ice cream and we had seconds and we were very excited about that. Um, and I also will mention actually just another quick story. In seventh grade, I stood up when my father got a speeding ticket that he believed was actually uh, not based on anything wrong he did, but racial bias. And I remember him just wanting to pay the ticket and just be done with it. But I had such a firm belief in American values, our aspirational values of justice for all, that I said, no, dad, we have to challenge that ticket. And I, you know, walked with him into the courthouse, even as a middle schooler, and wanted to object to this, what I believe was racially, you know, uh, uh, a charged ticket. And the way he was treated was really bad as well. And the, the judge, I remember, looked at me and said, are you a lawyer? When I tried to speak for my father, and I said, no. And he said, then sit back down. And I did, and I was shocked. Uh, fortunately, my dad get, did get the ticket dismissed because the officer didn't show up uh, when I had submitted a request, you know, the subpoena. So fortunately, uh, we did feel like we got a sense of justice, but it just shows my very firm commitment to justice and my firm belief in these aspirational ideals of what makes our country great. So I really am a proud American Muslim. Now, I am not at all naive to so many of the dark, ugly chapters of our country's past including the gross injustices done to our native black and brown siblings and the ongoing and continuing horrible racism and systems of oppression that have afflicted us and continue to plague us to this very day. And in fact, even as we are facing and seeing this national uprising for racial justice, we are also uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that this is the pandemic that has lasted for 400 years and has been a far greater problem in terms of the number of lives it has uh, taken uh, than even COVID right now. Nor am I dismissing how many today call themselves proud Americans or patriots in order to promote this sort of return to a racist time in our nation's history. Having said all of that, I still firmly believe in the aspirational ideals of our country, and that is exactly why I'm so bothered by what I see happening in our country. This, again, this growing divisiveness, this kind of propaganda effort that is what the Islamophobia industry is all about. You heard the statistics, the data, the information, and the examples from uh, Dear Reverend Terry. But I wanna also talk about the real life impact because for the past seven years, ever since I had a spiritual transformation and I left my legal career in order to pursue service and knowledge, two things that Islam emphasizes so greatly, what I've experienced and seen is one thing in my own life, which is the, the growing beautiful impact that Islam and a better understanding of Islam has had in my life and in my, on my family's life. But at the same time, in stark contrast to that, I've been seeing a very ugly narrative about Islam and Muslims being promoted, being propagated, and hearing it all around me all day, every day, especially in places like social media, but also from our elected leaders and politicians and pundits and the media and more, having it all around us to the point that it's like the air we breathe. And the impact of that is so great on the daily lives of American Muslim children and their families. And people like myself even, who go out, you know, and I've literally had people drive by, roll down their windows and yell obscenities at me. Tell me to go home when I'm literally a mile away from my home on Alki Beach and somebody 
tells, yells at me to, to go back to my country or go back home. I've seen and experienced these, and I've also know that I'm not alone. We have seen a huge increase in the kind of uh, anti-Muslim uh, assaults, attacks, violence, uh, property damage, vandalism on, on mosques. The mosque that I'm with, the Muslim Association in Puget Sound, we've had our sign vandalized. Uh, it's been attacked, it was attacked twice in less than a month. And the second time it was captured on video with somebody viciously attacking the sign. And when you attack a place like a mosque, you're not just attacking one sign or one sort of uh, building, you are attacking the entire community. The Muslims that I know, friends, family, community members, the Muslims that I know, pretty much all of them, especially those who are visibly Muslim like myself, you know, women who choose to wear a head covering or others who are visibly identifiable as Muslim, they are facing discrimination and bigotry and almost every single person I know has personally experienced a level of Islamophobia, whether it's been the more violent forms or the microaggressions on a daily basis. That is a reality. Children in schools being bullied, you know, facing discrimination. My little niece in middle school had to answer when her teacher raised a really Islamophobic uh, sort of, uh, or gave a really Islamophobic presentation uh, about sort of who Muslims were in her class when she's a Muslim there sitting in class. Mm -hmm. And she then took, a, took the time to write a letter to her teacher and explain how that was just bigoted and wrong. And the teacher did apologize to her, but the impact on the rest of the class remained. And this is happening in our schools across the country. People are being taught a certain narrative, a certain threat or fear narrative that contradicts reality. And I will say it contradicts reality because we, we directly have the statistics and the data and the information. You saw some of it from Reverend Terry but I will also say that just this past week, the Department of Homeland Security uh, had their report that identified the biggest source of threat in our country is from white supremacists. That is a matter of fact. That has been the case throughout the past several decades, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the threat to our country does not come from Muslims or people who look like me or my family or others. It comes from a very different place. But the reality is that no matter what the stats and the data are, that's not, what change, that, that's, that's not enough to change hearts and minds. That's not what the narrative that people believe actually is. It doesn't matter how many reports come out repeating that same uh, fact. There is a fear narrative because no matter how many sort of white Christian men, for instance, like Dylan Roof, engage in ideologically based violence and even write about sort of uh, write manifestos about their violence and justifying their actions, no matter how much that happens, people do not look at those individuals and say, that's what Jesus taught. Because we know better. People do not look at that and say, this is what Christianity teaches, because we know better. And the reality is that a lot of people don't personally know a Muslim. And when you don't personally know uh, members of a, a community that is being dehumanized in this kind of way, then it's very easy for you or for others, for people in our community to be manipulated with misinformation. And that's what we are seeing today, this misinformation campaign. But that's really what it is. It is false witness against your Muslim neighbors, which is a direct violation of the Ten Commandments. And, you know, there's a lot of cherry picking of verses from the Quran. We can do that with any religious scripture. You know, I can find verses from the Bible, and I know I've, I've shared this in many presentations I've given. I can identify verses from the Bible. You've seen studies of people sort of, or not studies, but uh, examples of people out on the streets showing passages of the Bible, telling folks this is the Quran and people believing it and being shocked when they find out that it's the Bible. And I don't say that to demean the Bible. I know that Jesus, peace be upon him, Moses, peace be upon him, so many other great prophets and, and uh, people uh, coming from these beautiful uh, religious backgrounds, wisdom traditions, that they taught good. But when they are manipulated, when that religious scripture is taken and manipulated in a way to hurt us, that is what's been problematic. And that's why I've been sort of on the front lines. I've seen the good and the bad. And I say this because I've seen those moments where people, as, as Terry mentioned, people are full of fear 
and that we'll have a session and we'll talk to them about this and you just see the difference in them you see this weight this evil this darkness being lifted when they themselves and they will admit this sometimes even i've literally had people come to me cry to me you know shed tears and admit that they harbored uh, resentment and anger and fear and they didn't know how much that was hurting them so it's not just about saving me. It's not just about, you know, getting the, the factual information out there and believing reality, but it's also the impact that this kind of fear and manipulated fear, manipulated threat, how it hurts all of us as Americans. You heard Terry say how it makes us less safe. That's absolutely true. It takes resources away from where our, our efforts actually should be focused but it also distorts this narrative and promotes a divisiveness between we the people when in fact we should be united standing against all forms of hate. That's what's so critical. And in fact, when people get to know their Muslim neighbors, they are often surprised by how much we have in common, especially if they come from a Christian background or a Jewish background. But this is the result of this industry, this Islamophobia industry. And we see the impact directly on everyday Muslim children, on everyday Muslims who've been uh, harassed and, and have sort of concerns and threats uh, and violence even. Uh, and I talked about some of the direct impact that I have had. You know, we've had detentions and surveillance and even Muslim registries uh, and so much more. And this really is a bipartisan problem. It is not unique to one side or the other. But we are seeing the consequences of this consistent demonizing of Islam and Muslims throughout our country when in fact the narrative is not, uh, is portrayed a certain way even though it contradicts reality. And that's why it's always important. So I have to just throw out some, some statistics, some actual information about Muslims. You know, first off, there's so much diversity within the worldwide Muslim population. And you're never really presented with that diversity. You are presented with one or two countries as examples of all Muslims when that is not the reality. There are over 1.8 billion Muslims in the world and the overwhelming majority are simply trying to live their lives and do good exactly as the Quran commands us to do, like me and my family. There are about 50 Muslim majority countries in the world and 80 other countries where Muslims make up a sizable minority of 10% or more. So the Muslim world is actually very diverse. And here in our country, the American Muslim population is about, you know, one to up to 3%, depending on which uh, sort of statistics you look at. But the community is generally well integrated, has some of the highest entrepreneurship rates and educational attainment for women, and is the most diverse faith community in, their, in, in our country. And every day, American Muslims are, are out there doing their part to help build a better country for us all. I see this and experience this directly in the work that I do through MAPS. We have this whole social and humanitarian services arm that has been helping people through this pandemic. People of all backgrounds, all uh, races, all genders, all sexualities, all uh, uh, sexual orientation, all uh, ethnicities, religions, it does not matter because we are committed to doing good because that's exactly what our faith teaches us. So that's sort of the reality, but that was, you know, no matter how much this kind of factual information or statistics I might have, we know that that does not change hearts and minds. People still have stereotypes of Muslims and other people of color in a way that they do not about our white, especially Christian brothers and sisters. But part of what I want to sort of leave you with is this idea that that is intentional. It is part of a propaganda effort. You know, this is, this is the mainstream narrative is written in a certain way to make certain groups appear to be a greater threat than they actually are. And this is also why certain people get labeled the T word with the associated group blame, even though when others engage in similar action, they are described in a very different way, you know, as lone wolves with mental problems or troubled kids. These are all characteristics of, you know, Dylan Roof, for instance, who uh, Reverend Terry talked about, and many other people as well. So we see the media bias, we see the impact on how stories are covered, and all of this, including with this whole industry that is promoting a certain narrative that hurts us all as Americans, we see how that all contributes to people's perception of who is and is not a threat in our country. And that perception contradicts reality. And I just want to say, you know, friends, that we ourselves, we are able to differentiate one violent Christian criminal, for instance, from the entire religion, because we know enough about Christianity and Christians to not fear all of Christianity or all Christians when one does something bad. 
Imagine if all we heard about Christianity were the Dylan Roofs of the world. And imagine if we combine that with certain violent verses of the Bible taken out of context. That gives you a sense of what's actually happening with Muslims and Islam and the Quran. That really is what Islamophobia is all about. And again, it's not by accident. It's a well-funded infrastructure behind all of this. But here's one thing I want to point out, that it is not something new. And what I mean by that is if you actually know history, if you actually follow history and know that this sort of nativist sentiment, this sense that we've had in our country, uh, that is something that has been stoked by politicians and promoted in our country throughout history. This isn't the first time we are seeing these kinds of dire consequences of American nativism in our country, even though, again, the reality is that Muslims have been part of our country since the very beginning. But about a century ago, Americans were concerned about another minority group among us, Catholics. And at that time, Catholics were the chief, you know, were a chief target of bigotry and discrimination and suspected of loyalty to a foreign power. Several states even sanctioned convent inspection laws to uncover weapons supposedly stashed in nunneries. And we can look back today and be like, well, that was ridiculous. And that's sort of what we're experiencing again. In the mid 20th century, Jews were accused of causing uh, the Wall Street uh, crash and the First World War and trying to drag America into a second one. In fact, in 1939, 61% of Americans opposed offering Jewish children asylum. This is similar to those opposing accepting Syrian refugees, for instance, today. We saw this with our Japanese American siblings who were held in internment camps. You know, we see this pattern throughout history. And it's this idea that in, you know, in each one of these scenarios, there are certain factors that come together that create this fear and this narrative of fear. And that's what we are seeing today. And these sort of various things that we see, according to The Economist, are economic trouble, which is very certain today, anxiety over security, especially national security, which we are seeing today, and racial and religious unease. And today we are seeing all of those factors coming together and, and, and there's this sort of creeping threat that what was sort of to some a white, mostly Christian country is becoming far more diverse. So that contradicts our aspirational American values. Again, that justice for all, you know, liberty for all, that coming together, the, the, the things that I find so beautiful about our country, those are all under threat in these kinds of efforts to scapegoat a certain group and demonize them. And, and in, in a lot of ways, a lot of these groups that are involved in this, they make money off of this. You know, they profit uh, politically off of this. And the people that get hurt are not just Muslims, it is all of us as Americans. When we cave into this kind of fear, we lose what makes us strong. We lose our ability to withstand sort of, you know, state-sponsored forms of intrusion on our privacy, on our civil rights, on our liberties. We lose what makes us Americans. And we also really sort of go against our faith values if we are people of faith. Our human values, our moral values, our ethical values. The best way to fulfill this kind of safety and security for all is to, in fact, enforce and ensure justice and liberty for all. And that's really what this is sort of about. That's part of why we do what we're doing. And it's so important that these moments, is especially, and I will close with this point, that, and I say this all the time to people, that as bad as things may be, it is an amazing time to be alive. Right now, you know, even though there is a negativity, I am still proud to be an American Muslim. And I'm so honored to be on the front lines of seeing hearts and minds changing, of seeing so many people of different backgrounds coming together, bipartisan support at times even, for various sort of human, American, moral, and ethical values. And that's what I call all of us to do, to not allow us to be sort of driven by this narrative of fear, by this narrative of, uh, you know, uh, certain core hate groups spreading hate in a way that divides us. We cannot allow the haters or the hate to win. It is our time to really change this narrative and promote a very different narrative. Because more, today more than ever, with social media, with the internet, with the power that we have, each one of us has the true power, possibility, privilege, and I would even say responsibility to do our part because we are literally writing history right now with our words and our actions or inactions. 
And if we fail to participate now and do our part, then we will be the very same people who sat through and watched slavery or sort of what happened to our Jewish siblings in Nazi Germany or what happened during the civil rights moment, movement. This is our moment, this is our time, and we truly have this incredible opportunity and potential to make a real difference in the future soul and direction of our country. We can contribute to this narrative of facts over fiction, of love over hate, and faith over fear, in order to create a more perfect union and a country and a community where we are all better off as one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Anila, thank you so much for that. And, and while we let you catch your breath, we just want to remind everybody that, um, that there's, there's Q&A here now. We're going to be entering into a Q&A time. So we encourage you to, to write down any questions you have in there, and we'll try to tackle as many as we can. I'd like to start uh, with with one, uh, you know, Paul has asked uh, how important is religious faith, you know, to this. And I certainly, uh, in my public speeches, always talk about two motivations that I have. One is as a, a person of faith, you know, um, and uh, but the other is as an American citizen. Um, and and both are equally important to me. You know, we have certain certain uh, values that we state in our U.S. constitutional values and other founding documents that that are aspirational. Of we've never reached any of them, all of them yet. We've ne not perfected any of them, but they're very important to us. Liberty and justice for all, the notion of we the people, u pluribus unum, uh, equal protection under the law. I mean, there's just so many beautiful statements, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. All of these must be stood for by, by all members in a society. And when we see fear being developed and, and utilized as a tool, as a weapon, it's up to all of us to, to stand up, not simply for the group being targeted, but so that all of us can live in peace with one another. And so I think if, if you are a person of faith, like that's, that's great and you can certainly be motivated by that. But, uh, but I don't think you have to be a person of faith to be motivated to, to recognize that when we're being split apart by fear into so many little different groups, that that's not gonna be good for us, that's not gonna be good for peace, that's not good for our neighborhood, that's not good for our democracy. And, uh, and so I just want to talk about that important religious thing. And then sometimes people will walk up to me and say, well, Pastor Terry, why do you do this? And I, there's another question here, you know, from Jay a little bit about that. You know, why, why am I doing this as a Christian pastor? And my answer is always very, very simple, because of Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus told me to not only love my enemy, but love my neighbor, but to love my enemy. Jesus taught me to stand up for justice, even when it's not easy. And, he, and, and, and so I, I feel very strongly that, 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 that Jesus has called me into this work um, so, that, um, so that I can be the human being that God's creating me to be. So I can be an authentic follower of Jesus. And, uh, and I've come to appreciate many things about Islam. Um, but, but I identify as a Christian. I worship in, in Christian church. I preach in Christian churches frequently. And I have great respect for my Jewish and Muslim and Buddhist and Hindu. And I also have great respect for my atheist and agnostic and humanist friends who have a lot of excellent questions and thoughts. And I share a lot of values with them. Uh, so it's just, it's really important for you to understand my motivation is, is, is part, uh, part as being a, a part of a democracy. And the other part of my motivation is because uh, I feel that Jesus has called me to stand with my neighbor. Um, and, and I believe he would do the same. Uh, so another, another question here is from Mary Anila, and I thought we, we might tackle that one next. And obviously we're gonna be talking more about this question over the, over the coming webinar. I mean, that's a lot of what we're gonna be covering is how do you change hearts and minds? But I thought we could give Mary just a little, a few minutes each uh, about how we sort of understand uh, changing hearts and minds. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mary, for the question. It is a fantastic one. Uh, and as Terry said, we will be addressing this throughout this series. But specifically, uh, I think you even said this here, through relationships, 
absolutely. Personal relationships are one of the best ways to actually change hearts and minds. Because like I said, facts and stats, unfortunately, no matter how much of them I have with me, they will not change hearts and minds. And I'll give one quick story of an experience that I had. And this was actually at an anti-Muslim hate rally. Uh, the, the group Act for America had organized these rallies, I believe it was uh, in 2017, across our nation. So here in Seattle, I had put up uh, with a few others, I had put up a Ask a Muslim booth. And I remember at that, uh, there was a couple in particular that showed up. And it was the, the woman was in a wheelchair. And on her lap, she was holding a very ugly anti-Muslim sign. And her husband was with her. Uh, and I talked to both of them. And, you know, they had a lot of let's say, misinformation uh, about what Islam is or what the Quran teaches. And they kept saying these kinds of statements. And again, I know that's driven by the sort of narrative that the Islamophobia industry promotes because all of the points they were making were very much aligned with exactly what the Islamophobia industry has promoted and really drilled in people's hearts and minds. So they were making all of those kinds of statements and they were so sure of themselves. They're like, well, the Quran says this or that. And I'm like, no, I've read it plenty of times. It does not say that. Please show me if you want to show me. And nowhere does it say that. So, you know, I went through that experience with them. And I don't know if I changed their hearts or minds, but I do know there was a moment where I'm literally holding the woman's ar a hand in my arms. You know, my arms are clasped around hers. And we had this human moment. And I like to believe that that personal connection might have been the first and only time she's ever actually talked to a Muslim. You know, most of what she has seen or heard about Muslims has come from a hate industry, has been what she's seen on Fox News or other places like that. And that has been the sum of her experience with Muslims. So certainly having a personal connection. And if we could have continued the conversation, I firmly believe we could have, you know, changed hearts and minds if we didn't already. I've other, had other times where I've spoken at places. And as I mentioned, I had people come up to me and even admit that they harbored this kind of negativity and that that two hours that they had that with us with me and Terry that that completely transformed them and they wanted to learn what they could do to counter that among themselves and their friends and family and others so personal connections and relationships are absolutely the best but not everybody gets the opportunity to connect with a Muslim when Muslims are such a small minority in our country right so unless each one of us had like a thousand friends uh, it would be very hard to do that so that's why the next best thing is personal stories. And that's why one of the things we promote so much is to learn about Islam and, and sort of meet Muslims to the extent you can, visit a mosque if you can, of course, after COVID. Uh, but, you know, those are great ways to connect directly and, and engage in service activities and other work together. But if people don't have that connection, please know that each one of you has a network that I might not have access to. You are ambassadors. You can be the one sharing stories. And those personal stories are far more powerful than debating somebody online or somewhere else. Instead of spending your time debating on some social media posts, and I will tell you, anytime there's something about Islam or Muslims, there's a lot of negativity in the comment section. Instead of spending time debating that or repeating the negative messaging, what you can do is instead use every opportunity, every platform you have, whether it's a church newsletter, whether it's a uh, you know, community gathering, your own social media page, just share positive, personalizing human stories. And those are profound. And there have been so many people who have literally experienced that transformation themselves, or if you haven't, you can share stories of people who have, that those kinds of personal stories are the next best thing to the immediate personal uh, interaction and relationships. So those are the two things we will really emphasize. Uh, and one, one way you can do this is to share these kinds of personal stories. Talk about a friend or neighbor that you may know who's Muslim that you know, maybe feeds the homeless or is out there serving the community in some other way. Those kinds of stories are far more powerful than even the facts and stats and data sometimes. But I, and I think just to, to add on to Anila a little bit here, um, we have to recognize that this takes a lot of time. And it really isn't our job to change somebody else's mind, right? That's kind of uh, up to them. And if you're a person of faith, like that's kind of up to God, right? Um, and so don't put yourself in the position of having to convince them. Recognize that it takes a long time sometimes for people uh, to, to change their opinion. And, and that you're not going to just do it in one conversation. I have a family member, for instance, who was very skeptical of the work I do, came and heard Anila a couple times, spoke with her, spoke with me a bunch of times. And, and finally, you know, he said, well, so what you guys are really saying is 
is that we should protect the civil and religious liberties of Muslims. And I said, yeah, that's what we're saying. You're not talking about all these other issues. No, this is what we're talking about. Well, I'm in favor of that. And it just took a long time for him to kind of like, and, and so remember a lot of the, co the power in a conversation, it happens after the conversation's over, not right in the middle of it. Second thing is like, let's consider for a minute where fear comes from. I said this a bit earlier, we fear about that which we love. So I love my daughters, I love my, my wife, my mother-in-law who's living with, with us here. I care about them, a threat to them is gonna really get me activated. And so I know a gentleman, you know, who walked up to me once at a, at a, at a meeting and was just like so angry uh, about some things he had heard about Islam with respect to women. And he had three daughters, he had a spouse that he cared for, you know, through her uh, Alzheimer's disease. He's a lovely man. Like I respect and, and, and admire him. But he had been sold a bill of lies about Muslims and about Islamic teachings with regard to women. And so he was mad at, at Muslims because he loved women. But then I explained to him some of the teachings and you could just see him begin to change. And I had several more conversations with him and it took quite a while. And all of a sudden he was able to see that he had actually been manipulated by people using what he loved to make them afraid of other American citizens who are a part of us. And then his anger shifted, <laughs> not toward being, not toward Muslims and Islam, but it shifted towards some of the media sources that he had been, uh, been reading, uh, um, been taking information from. So um, one of the things I, I see here uh, is from a question from Maria. And I just want to say um, she's a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And Anil and I have been hosted quite a few times by, uh, by LDS churches across the state and, and have found them to be really um, excellent partners in this conversation because that, that, that church has also received uh, some religious bigotry over the years. And, uh, and she asks, you know, what can she do more to, you know, about than speaking to friends? And, you know, we'd be happy to come and speak at, a, at, a, at, a, at an event uh, in your congregation, uh, Maria. But I, I just want to say, like, don't underestimate the power of you speaking to friends. And that's kind of the power of active bystanders, according to Irvin Staub, is that they, they actually just, just say, well, hey, wait a minute, I know positive stories about Muslims. And they just let them, just let them happen. And so one, one question I get a lot um, uh, when we're out and about is, is, you know, what do I do at Thanksgiving supper, you know, which is coming up pretty soon? You know, what, what happens if one of my family members says a bunch of anti-Muslim stuff? Number one, don't try to debate the, the, the Quran because you probably don't know it well enough to do that. Neither do they, but they think they do, right? Um, just tell a positive story and then share your deeply held values. You know, share a positive story and say, you know, um, I, I, I believe it's really important for us to learn about Muslims from Muslims, not from people who hate Muslims. And just make, just come prepared with one little statement like that. And then just let that sit in the room. But remember, the, person you, the persons you're trying to convince are not necessarily the person that made the hateful statement. Because there are around that Thanksgiving dinner, persuadable people. We get too focused in this kind of work trying to counteract people who are in the opposition. And we don't think carefully enough about working with people who are persuadable in that audience. And so I just wanna encourage you to remember to be brief share a brief value that you have that you think everybody else would share, share a positive story, and then let that story and that value work on the folk around that table. And you might find that as you're cooking, as you're cleaning up the dishes afterward, someone will walk up to you and say, can you tell me more? And so that's what I want to, so I, what I want to say to you, Maria, is you're already doing an awful lot and don't underestimate that. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. Appreciate the work you are doing and look forward to, ha to having continued engagement with you and so many others who are uh, truly amazing friends and allies through this kind of uh, effort and through this work. So appreciate that. Um, I wanted to address a question that uh, somebody anonymously uh, posted here about whether or not Islamophobia is unique to the US or whether we see it around the world in parts of Asia and Europe uh, as part of a coordinated international effort or cultural spillover uh, or as 
as a result of the ease with which Muslims are painted as the other. Uh, so, you know, that, that is a reality that Islamophobia is certainly not limited to the U.S. Uh, it, there are forms of Islamophobia around the world right now. And a lot, oftentimes what you will see is when there is a political agenda. You know, in the U.S., for instance, it may have to do with our uh, war in the Middle East or, you know, our foreign policy at times, uh, whether it has to do with Palestine or whether it has to do with uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, when we want a excuse or reason to support uh, certain foreign policy decisions, it's very useful to demonize or dehumanize uh, a community. So we see that being as one part of the Islamophobia uh, and that why the industry is so welcomed at times uh, here in our country. But we see that also in other places. Right now, sort of a new burgeoning area of uh, direct Islamophobia specifically promoted for an ideological reason or to support political uh, decisions is as in India, for instance, where we have Hindu supremacist types of groups or Hindutva uh, that have been promoting very ugly anti-Muslim bigotry and hatred uh, ar around the world uh, to justify some of the actions there. Uh, so we see that there. We've seen it in China, for instance. Uh, and again, in each one of these places, you have discrimination and actual policies, uh, excuse me, actual policies implemented against Muslims uh, that are very horrifying, even violent, like with the uh, concentration camps even of uh, Uyghur Muslims who are placed in concentration camps uh, in China, uh, or some of the uh, religiously discriminatory laws that have even led to India being a uh, recommendation made by a bipartisan committee to demote them in terms of their religious freedom uh, uh, because of the kinds of religious discriminatory laws and the sort of vigilante violence that we are even seeing against Muslims in India. So we are seeing uh, different countries, and this is certainly true in Europe as well. So there is uh, sometimes a unique flavor to the Islamophobia, and the dog whistles may be different, or some of the tropes may be different, but it is very much connected. And they absolutely, these different organizations that are promoting a narrative of hate and violence and fear very much feed off of each other. They share content with each other. They, uh, you know, sort of use each other as echo chambers, um, and they, they take it and almost personalize some of the Islamophobia to really promote ugly, even violence at times in different places around the globe. And I will say that, unfortunately, that those other forms of Islamophobia do not just stay in those places. In fact, in, in our area, in, in Redmond, uh, we had uh, uh, an instance where we were trying to deal with this group, a Washington nonprofit uh, called APPWW, uh, that was promoting really ugly anti-Muslim sentiments and giving platform to speakers who were well-known is Islamophobes, uh, anti-Muslim bigots. Um, and there was a very beautiful collaboration of over 140 organizations uh, across our area coming together and condemning the hate by this group and its leaders and the speakers to whom they gave a platform. Uh, but unfortunately, and this is an instance of liberal Islamophobia, the Redmond City Council watered down, the majority watered down a resolution that would have condemned the hate by this specific group. And it's so important when you are seeing these kinds of instances of hate being promoted that all of us stand united, stand firm, and stand clear in our opposition to this kind of hate or hateful rhetoric because it's the hateful rhetoric that directly leads to hateful actions. That's why it's so important to call it out, to condemn it, and take a firm stand. And that does not take away from free speech. Groups and organizations spread anti-Muslim commentary and sentiments all the time, and they are free to do so. But we also have our beautiful free speech right to call them out and to condemn that and make it clear that that does not align with our values of unity, of, of love, of solidarity, and standing up firmly against hate against any marginalized group. Yeah, because uh, it, it, out of a current, uh, out of a recent, fairly recent Supreme Court case, you know, it's very clear that the hate speech is is actually constitutional, but the only remedy for it, according to the justices, um, is to use our own free speech. And we have to, so, you know, so part of what's happening here, I like to think about human beings being in human communities or human societies being vulnerable to certain kinds of things. And especially when we're feeling um, anxious and we don't think particularly unified amongst ourselves, it is very common for leaders to try to use a third group, someone who's perceived to be a third group, as, as a way to sort of be, make them an enemy and then develop our kind of unity against them. Uh, the, the problem is that, that it just keeps on going. 
and going and going and going and more and more and more groups become the other. And then what ends up happening is that we, the people end up becoming divided in ways that just aren't, aren't necessary or appropriate and that lead to actual violence, not only by individuals, but the violence of unjust laws and even the violence, as uh, I was talking about earlier, of dangerous speech leading to, to genocide. And so we have to understand that, I mean, this is the hard, hardest thing. It's really hard for people to, to recognize that maybe we have taken in racist ideas against our Muslim neighbors. You know, there's a couple, there's a lot of questions here from one, from one gentleman today who uh, seems to have gotten a lot of his information from the Islamophobia industry. And like is interpreting the Quran, basically some parts of the Quran uh, based not on what Muslims teach, but based on what anti-Muslims are lying about them. And I just want to encourage that person to, you know, to, you know, contact us or to contact a, a local imam and ask those questions. Because many of the interpretations of certain words that you're using in the chat, in the, in the Q&A, um, are not Islamic teaching, not mainstream Islamic teaching. We also got to be careful uh, when you're out there doing research, folks, because probably 80% of the websites that are out there purporting to be about um, our American Muslim sisters and brothers are in fact created by these hate groups as a way, as a tool of misinformation. And so I just really want to encourage that as a Christian, I hope people will learn from me about me. They'll learn about Lutheranism from Lutherans who are like, have a degree and like have a job, <laughs> you know, I, I want them to learn about me. I don't want them to learn from Dylan Roof about me. And so it's really important as Anila often says to learn about Muslims from Muslims. Like, and, and that's just about basic integrity, you know, as a person going to the source and asking them. And the other piece that you got to understand that's so important is that the Christian scriptures, for instance, were written, you know, nearly 2000 years ago, not quite. There is a whole lot of cultural change and differences between first century Palestinian, Palestine, you know, as a context and today. And as a Christian pastor, I spend a lot of my time understanding that context and how to translate that effectively into a sermon for, for people and, and into Bible studies and that sort of thing. Well, the, the, the Quran was, was, uh, was written to a very different culture. And so it's super important for us to take the time to understand that culture before we just jump in and think, well, we've got it all figured out because it's way more complicated than that. And, and so I just wanna say that that, that kind of, of um, we, we're, we're in an environment of deep anxiety. It's easy for us to just like have our guts jump to hate somebody or be, be fearful of someone. And we really have to sit back, whether we're people of faith or not, whether we're, whether, whether we're doing it out of just being a, an informed American citizen and, uh, and make sure that we are getting the best information from the source and not from people who seek to dis distract us and tell us lies about our neighbors. So uh, as Terry had mentioned in the beginning, we're happy to stay on and continue answering questions because it does look like there's at least 21 more questions that folks have. Uh, so we're happy to stay on for that, but we also want to be conscious of the time. We did say we would go for up to about an hour 15. So if anybody has to leave at this time, uh, we just want to say thank you so very much for joining yes. us. Uh, please do tune in next week. So this will be on every Sunday for five total times. So next Sunday, 4 p.m. Uh, so we're definitely looking looking forward to that. And while this was sort of an overview of this entire industry, what we hope to do each uh, specific session is dive deeper into some of the specific themes and topics. So whether it's women's rights, you know, uh, there may be questions around that, whether it has to do with Sharia, I saw some questions around that. We will be diving deeper into these and we welcome you to be part of this journey with us because we hope after we go through this entire journey together, um, even some of the people who had a lot of doubts uh, or different different perspectives on things, uh, we invite you back. Please join us if you're willing to continue the conversation. We would love having you. And feel free to continue asking your questions. Uh, and we can maybe give like a one minute break for folks who are going to jump off and then continue answering questions, uh, or some of the other questions that are on here as well. That's, does that sound good, Terry? Yeah, well, I don't think we need to take a break. I just th thanks everybody for being here. Next week, we're going to talk about Islam and peace. So if you have any questions about Islam and what it teaches about peace and how people relate to each other as individuals or societies, 
uh, that's going to be the week the week for you. Um, and I, I just want to once again kind of you know I got another question from this one individual. Uh, I just I just want to say like even if you have talked to one one Lutheran like Dylan Roof was one Lutheran. So would you sit in a jail cell with him and take his word for what Lutherans teach? Well, the answer is no. Like there's a whole scholarly understanding of, of Lutheranism out there and you're going to take one person and make them more important than all the rest. Like that's just silly. So if you want to be serious about it, like the most important thing is to go to an imam and start asking them some questions. And so I just want to say again, uh, please, uh, please, please do that. Um, so uh, Anila, what other questions would you like to take on here? I wanted to address one question that asked about sort of what's the support for uh, Islamophobia increasing around election time. Uh, there's actually an institute called the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, ISPU, that actually has looked at specifically Islamophobia and opinions that people hold about Islam and Muslims uh, through the course of, you know, however long they've done their research. But they're the ones, and, and Dahlia Magahed is the main researcher uh, for ISPU, and they have looked extensively at at this question of what is the source of increase in anti-Muslim sentiment. And what she has found, what ISPU has found specifically is that uh, the anti-Muslim sentiment in our country has not been after an incident like 9-11, even though of course there was a huge increase in, in anti-Muslim hate crimes, but the opinions of general people uh, sort of across the board, that's not when you saw a spike. When you saw a spike was specifically uh, during the 2008 and 2012 election seasons. Uh, so it was specifically people wanting to use Islamophobia as a tool of public manipulation and trying to manufacture sort of support for various wars and also for, for you know, uh, trying to get votes. That's where we saw Islamophobia or the, the view of Muslims and Islam really uh, go down in the negative numbers was around those times, not around you know, specific instances. Uh, and that's a reality uh, based on the research from ISPU and others as well. And we'd be, I could, well, we don't have, let me see if I could try to share the link to one of these, at least to the person who asked that question. Terry, is there any other question that you wanted to answer? Well, I, there, 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 there's a, um, you know, there, I mean, one of the questions that we're going to get to in the, in Islam and peace, you know, is, is, uh, I don't know, I think we should wait till next week to really get to it. I just want to let, let Jay know that we're, we will get to the issue of, of, of some of the, the, the Islamic phrases that are sort of misunderstood by the Islamophobia industry, including the word jihad um, and infidel. We will talk about those uh, in the, in the coming week. Because um, those are really important questions, uh, really important words that are often misunderstood and taken completely out of context. Um, and so we just want you to know we will answer those questions. It's just, you know, today's not the day to do that. And, and I would also add, too, I, I see your comment here, Jay, that uh, perhaps a private conversation would be more appropriate because it does sound like you have a, a lot of questions and a lot of uh, desire to get some answers to some of these questions. Uh, and Terry and I uh, can maybe follow up with you. If, if, uh, if Ian has your contact information, we can maybe follow up and really try to address some of those questions uh, and especially allow for the other sessions, hopefully you'll join us, uh, to hear what the perspectives are that are shared there and some of the additional factual information information, some of the additional content that we'll be able to provide to help address those very concerns that you are raising. So hopefully we will get through. And you know, somebody asked about how do we change hearts and minds? We do it this way, through actual conversations and through getting to know each other. You know, we respect you. We hope you respect us and have this kind of dialogue that doesn't happen often enough. And we need more of this kind of bridge building and people willing to engage and learn from, uh, from each other. So hopefully we can continue the conversation with you and so many others as well. So for the folks who are still with us, uh, thank you so very much for, st for staying with us. Uh, and again, there's a lot of information. We're trying not to inundate everybody all at once. So we're kind of do it, going to do it in sort of bite-sized pieces uh, throughout the next few weeks. But one of the points that I want to mention that we will also be doing is um, hopefully incorporating it when we talk about each specific topic is specific ways that you can respond to these kinds of questions or comments that people make. 
because that's another reality that many of us may directly hear people who will make very anti-Muslim comments when it comes to peace or violence or when it comes to women's issues or when it comes to Sharia and how do you respond effectively? Because unfortunately, we also have people who respond ineffectively, uh, not knowing that they could be doing more damage by repeating negative stereotypes or uh, reaffirming certain negative tropes, um, uh, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. So this is something that we want you to be aware of uh, and you know, keep in mind the proper messaging and the proper ways to actually reach people and hopefully be able uh, to create the kind of change that we want to see. And I just want to add one final point and then uh, maybe we can close it out for today's session at least. Yeah. And that is specifically that, you know, just like Terry is driven by his faith values, I'm driven in the work that I do by my faith values, you know, and I will admit that if I did not have my faith, I would not have the strength or the patience to really deal with the so many people that I encounter on a daily basis who hold very negative views about me, about my religion, uh, about my community and others. It's really my faith that grounds me, that gives me that strength and that ability because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us to show forgiveness and kindness even to the people who do you wrong. Because the Quran mandates that we treat people well, that we do good, that the best of us are those who bring benefits to society. And in fact, the Quran has a specific verse that talks about how if you actually show, sort of show good, in, in response to evil or in response to negativity, if you're actually able to show good, that that good can result in people who were your devoted, uh, uh, avowed enemies, who are your avowed enemies to become like your devoted friends. And, and I literally know people, I've met people who have experienced that, who've even been sort of uh, wanting to or engaged in attacks against Muslims and mosques and other places. And they have had a, a change of heart. They are now advocates for combating Islamophobia, even if they may sort of still have their critiques of Islam. And that's totally acceptable. You know, we can all have our critiques of religion, but they are advocates of combating this kind of Islamophobia, of recognizing how it hurts all of us as Americans. And that's what we hope to do together, is to be able to learn and understand how this hurts us all and take action to ensure religious freedom for all of us. You know, whether we're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Sikh, Hindu, or otherwise. This is, this is our opportunity to really live out our faith values, our, again, aspirational American values, and to do what we can to help create the kind of world that we want to see. Yeah, I really believe that, 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 the, that the first words in the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, the, the Declaration of Independence, are really important. We the people. And we the people sometimes forget who we the people are. And it's important for us to, to, to learn to remember and to keep striving to remember um, that, that, all of, that all of us in this nation are in this together. And, but, the, but we still have to work for it because the forces of hate and the vulnerability of people to feel fear are very real. And politicians uh, trying to, um, to divide us in, for their own purposes is, is very real and powerful. But we, we are also powerful. And we thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully see you all next week. And we hope you have a great week. Thank you.